Thank you, thank you, uh, Federico, because the introduction is a uh, it's, it's nice to hear <laughs> this kind of uh, presentation, uh, uh, partially truth. Um, um, and, and, and thank you all for, for being here in this design week <laughs> at this time, Friday, instead of being having a, a cold beer uh, and finishing the week. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and allow, allowing me by allowing me to 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 share these ideas is is something that I I'm very interested uh, uh, to do. Uh, and this is another opportunity. And in fact, uh, uh, this is part. Uh, uh, this lecture is a condensed, condensed uh, 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 part uh, or expression of a, of a, an essay that will be part of a book I'm trying to finish. I'm trying to write and to finish this by be, being here in Milan this semester, uh, which is addressed, in fact, to uh, propose a sort of um, reconsideration of uh, the way we were understanding the history of modern architecture, in the sense that, that uh, I realized many years ago that, that um, for the historiography of art, it was absolutely, absolutely normal, uh, everybody knows, uh, about the uh, relationship between uh, modern art and uh, some expressions in the rest of the world. It would be impossible to understand, to say, common, common places, to understand, of course, Gauguin and the relation with the Pacific, or, or even Picasso and the relation uh, with uh, Africa, etc. So this is, this is a, something that is very uh, known, very well known in the historiography of of art, but this is this is not happening with the historiogra historiography of uh, architecture, and particularly with the historiography of modern architecture. And I'm not referring to just to the idea that many friends or some others, uh, many people have uh, about expanding the field or the geography of modern architecture. Uh, I want to say it's not about, in my opinion to add uh, other masters or many new figures from the rest of the world to the canon of, uh, of modern architecture or to the series of canonic figures in modern architecture. The point is how the rest of the world was uh, impacting, was part of the creation of the canon. This is, for me, this is the point. I mean, I'm glad, I, I think it's a, even it's, it's a very good step forward to now to consider in the recent books uh, figures like Luis Barragan in Mexico or Hassan Fatih in Egypt, whatever. It's, it's better than ignoring the existence of these architects. But this is not the point I'm trying to focus in. Uh, the point for me is how, <laughs> how to go from a sort of uh, simply uh, capitalist approach to the, uh, uh, the development of modern architecture to understand that it was not just we lived and we live, not just in a capitalist world, but we live also in, an, in moments, different moments of expansion of capitalism, that which in other uh, eras and other moments of the 20th century and the 19th century was called imperialism too. So we don't deal, uh, we are not dealing just, uh, if you see, uh, I was impressed, if you see the, in the famous, uh, for instance, in the famous uh, book by Bruno Zevi on modern architecture, the, he has a map. And in this map, he has a map of modern architecture. And it's fantastic because in this map, the world is small. Is Piece of the world, just just some cities in the in Europe related to some cities in the uh, I would say some cities mainly in Central Europe, and some cities in the eastern coast of uh, of uh, the United States. That's it, and uh, some other cities in the north probably, but not not too many. And the rest of the world, say, what means the rest, rest the rest of the world can be absolutely ignored. It's not existed. It was not part of what, what was happening in that moment. So 
uh, what I have to say uh, uh, to, to begin about, about this is that this is an obvious mistake because the war was there. So something has to happen, in, and not just for the beginning of the, of the uh, modern architecture and the 20th century, but for the rest of the development of modern architecture. So, so this, is the, this, is the, this is the argument I'm trying to develop since many years, and I'm now trying to close, uh, because it, if it results in a book, it will be a big book <laughs> with many essays, and because I was trying to investigate some particular uh, episode, some particular moment to, to show how this was happening. And even recently, I, I was uh, trying to understand how big figures of the historiography of modern architecture, like my master, Manfredo Tafuri, understood this, and why? My question de there was why someone so intelligent, so brilliant, so exceptional, like him, was so committed so th those big mistakes as that as ignoring uh, and, and and dismissing uh, Brazilian architecture as something unimportant. This this was not because ignorance. He, Manfred Tafuri was not ignorant at all. It was his point of view what conditioned uh, his way of looking at what was happening. So so this is what, what was a. What, what, what my concern is about, and this is just what I'm, I'm going to show uh, is just one, one of the episodes of this uh, book, uh, and as I'm saying, I'm, I, I had to reduce, uh, to, the, uh, to create a version to be read uh, today uh, to you, and to share with you. Uh, so, let's start with, with this uh, by showing this uh, as a way to start, let me show this. So this is a square, of course, more or less. And this is a house. So there is the debate. How uh, a sort of a realistic representation of, of a house has to be transformed by modern architecture in an abstract expression of a house. So the same is in one side some abstract is an abstract figure on one side and, so on, 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 and on the other side is a sort of representation which has to be eliminated from the nucleus in the nucleus of uh, the, the, the debates of modern architecture so but this is what the, this lecture is about so i uh, I will read. <clears throat> in, in, in one of the most uh, influential biographies of L Ludwig Miss van der Rohe, Franz Schulze reproduces a famous photomontage of the Weisenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart, inhabited by camels and by people with turbans and kaftans. Its didascalia states Arab village, a tricked up anonymous photograph of Weisenhof Housing Project 1934. Schulze informed that Stuttgart's architecture leaders, Paul Bonatz and Paul Schmittener, considered that the new architecture, as I quote them, a heap of flat cubes arranged in a manifold horizontal terraces, resembling a suburb of Jerusalem. For Schulze, this identification was an unfair attack on Mies attempt to reduce the buildings to, I quote him, cubic masses as a purification of architectural form. According to him, this attempt was founded in a network of deep philosophical, technical, and economic reasons that did not include any component from non-European origins. This interpretation is a commonplace in the historiography of modern architecture. And it is interesting to observe that in spite of their obvious political differences, both Schulze's and Bonat Schmittener's interpretations consider that such a component would constitute an attack a sort of offense or affront. 
I will try to show that Bonatz Schmittener's interpretation was right. In fact, references to Middle Eastern vernacular architecture were one of the components of canonical modern architecture. Needless to say, I think this fact does not constitute any kind of offense or attack. On the contrary, I believe that it is a demonstration of the benefit of cross-fertilization processes and cultural exchanges that, in spite of other numerous negative effects and authoritarian behaviors, came together with the expansion of capitalism all over the world. Since the treaties of Kuchuk Kainari in 1774, the main Western powers started their expansion into the territories under the control of the Ottoman Empire. With this expansion, Europeans intens intensified their interest in the magnificent monuments of the high civilization of the past in these territories. The importance of ancient Near Eastern monuments and archaeology grew up, especially during the second half of the 19th century. Until this moment, the main source for the knowledge of non-classical antiquity was the Bible. But after the unearthing of the palaces of Assyrian kings in the 1840s by the British and French, studies of the, those civilizations were expanded in both countries. With the creation of their own empire, Germany established an expansive, po expansive policy in the Middle East and consolidated it al its alliance with the Ottoman Empire. Archaeological and historical studies of Middle Eastern and ancient uh, cultures produced an important impact in the architectural debates of the late 19th century and in those cultural circles that were looking for alternatives to the Western architectural traditions. The studies of Zoroastrian Persia, the esoteric depths of ancient India, and the primeval innovation of the Assyrians and Sumerians gave place to a powerful attack on the traditional knowledge of antiquity based in the text of the Bible and the ancient Greek texts. And it, is, uh, it was mainly in Central Europe where the results of this impact was most impressive. Nevertheless, in spite of the growing interest in the culture and history of these regions, and in spite of the recognition of the values and implication of Oriental monumental art and architecture, Western early 19th century mentality did not attribute any aesthetic value to the cubic and disadorned houses inhabited by their contemporaries in those regions. On the contrary, these constructions, constructions were considered as despicable products of barbarism and cultural backwardness, insist talking about the early 19th century. In his 1830s first report on the recently discovered a quote, city of Timbuktu, the French René Caillé wrote, I had formed a totally different idea of the grandeur and wealth of Timbuktu. The city presented as first, at first view nothing but a mass of ill-looking houses built of earth. This is his drawing. And this is a more than picture of Timbuktu. Travelist literature of the 19th century is full of this initial <coughs> attitude of dismissal. Lamartine considered that Beirut, in Beirut, the houses, I quote, I quote him, the houses of the city rose up in a confused way, and the roof, the roofs of the houses served as terraces to the others. These houses, whose roofs were flat, announced the east. With the expansion of tourism, Jerusalem, as paradigmatic uh, Middle Eastern city, became accessible for a wider European public. Leon de Ralde, writes in 1881, quote, their houses are closed on the side of the street and received the day only by narrow and rare openings grilled or by courtiers. Most of them have terraces made of stone or clay. 
End of quote. Moreover, being part of the Ot Ottoman Empire for many centuries, the inhabitants of the Mediterranean basins regions of Europe, southern Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and particularly its lower orders, were not considered as part of the Western civilization. And it was clear that it, if this panorama existed in what was considered as a, a, a European territory, it was because the pernicious, quote, long-lasting influence of Islam in these regions. Ernest Renan wrote with regards to Sicily, I quote him again, it is neither Syria nor Greece. What is obviously dominant in the mixture of races here is the Arab element, or rather the Berber element and the Greco-Byzantine element. Crossing the villages of the western side, one thinks sometimes in Barbary. In one scene of his Histoire de l'Habitation Humaine, Violet Le Duc, character uh, Epergos, had to sleep in one of the habitation for the servants that surrounds one palace in Sicily. And where we are informed that, by Violet Le Duc, that his host explained how these dwellings were erected by Sicilian workers on the indications of architects educated, educated in Egypt. In the first modern description of modern Egypt, Edward William Lane describes the houses as follows. In many villages, large, large pigeon houses of a square form, but with the walls slightly inclining in walls, like many of the ancient Egyptian buildings, or of the form of a sugar loaf, loaf, are constructed upon the roof of the huts with crude brick, pottery, and mud. Taking into account the parallel efforts to create the idea of a common European foundation in antique Greece, it was probably more troubling to deal with contemporary poor and bizarre people that inhabit the land and the vestige of that great civilization. In his study on this cultural conflict, Robert Shannon Peckman remembered that Henry Bell, first secretary in the French embassy in the Kingdom of Greece between 1861 and 1863, remarked, Greece was a little corner of, Orient, of the Orient, just as it constituted a little corner of Europe. Considering Greece as Arabia and Africa reproduced an exotic topos that at least by the late 19th century had become ha as familiar as those projections of the European homeland against with which the exotic was being pitted. The contemptuous attitude with regards to vernacular construction in some territories of southern Europe and northern Africa was, was sustained by clear divisions between high and low culture and by what Todorov has called the Herodotus paradigm, which considered the other as barbarian and inferior, as opposite to ourselves. Nevertheless, Todorov has demonstrated that there is another way to see the other, the Homer paradigm, by which we consider this other as the inverted mirror of ourselves. All that we have bad, they have good, and vice versa. Todorov associated this paradigm to the search of the exotic. During the 19th century, the second paradigm was, paradigm, sorry, was represented by the romantic gaze, the search for authenticity in the primitive, the search for realms of feelings against the dominance of reason, the search for nature against artificiality, the search for nobility of cultures against the vulgarity of civilization. The romantic gaze is part of Homer's approach. Travelers, artists, politicians, anthropologists, archeologists, historians, philologists, and growing masses of common people visited the Orient directly or with, or, or with their imagination. And from this contact came new understandings and new representations and values were built and were put into circulation. 
Typical of the, of the changes determined by in situ experiences is the fa famous phrase by Eugene, Eugene uh, de la Croix after his first enco encounter with Morocco in 1832. He said, well, you fight, uh, addressing the French, you fight and conspire, ridiculous fools that you are. Go to Barbary to learn patience and philosophy. With regards to our topic, the Middle Eastern villages were represented at the, as the background of epic painting, like in De La Croix's second version of the Sultan of Morocco and his entourage, or is in, in his fanatics of Tanger, Tanger. In Edward Lear's Beirut, John Lavery's Tangier, the Way City, I saw Mameri's Vue de Fes, William Holman Hunt, uh, Bethlehem from the north, Nazareth and the Dome of the Rock, uh, Jacques Majorel, Mule Idris, or David uh, Bromberg, Jerusalem, looking to Mount Scopus. Flat roofs, terraces, absence of symmetry, geometrical clarity, and absence of decorations seem to have attracted more and more Western viewers. And this is the way Alphonse Asselberg represents the Kashba of Algiers. Uh, Gustav Guillaume La Seguia, Pre Biscra, Pre de Biscra, Eugène Fromentin, Une rue à El Aguat, uh, and uh, Ville d'Algerie, uh, uh, 1853, or already in the new century, Albert Marquet, his Aswan Matinee, and his Rue de Jacinier for example. Moreover, it was, it was the luminous quality of the spaces and the direct texture of the architecture that was exposed in the foreground as the very subject of the canvas by Jean Saint-Martin in uh, Rue d'Alger, Alfred de Odenc, interior of a Moroccan courtier, and Jacques Mayorel, Le Mur Blanc. Uh, in numerous postcards and albums, daguerreotypes and photographs registered, reproduced, and widely distributed the characteristic of vernacular Middle Eastern constructions, such as the examples of the photographic album of Jerusalem by Sergeant James MacDonald, or the work of Louis Leclerc in Tripoli, Auguste Salman in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and Henri Duveillé and James Robertson, among many others. Though some, some of the, these postcards, these uh, pictures in albums, etc., enormously diffused in, uh, in the West, in Europe mainly, uh, in, during the 19th century. Uh, there were many reasons and ways to romanticize the approach to this culture. At the end of the 19th century, Wilfred Cohen Bland wrote, the contrast between their, their, uh, their Arabs' noble pastoral life on the one hand, with their camel, camel's hairs and horses, a life of high tradition filled with the memory of heroic deeds, and on the other hand, the ignoble squalor of the Frank settlers with their wine shops and their swine was one which could not escape us. Blunt respected them, the Arabs, as equals, as fellow aristocrats, as gentlemen of the desert, his sympathy for the Arabs was, to a great extent, dependent on his own belief in aristocratic supremacy and, unfortunately, on his hostility to the, to the Jews. The romantic approach to Arab realities were observed with perplexity and in contradictory manners. Thackeray described with enthusiasm his first visit to Cairo in 1844. Quote, there is a fortune to be made for painters in Cairo. I never saw such variety of architecture, of life, of picturesqueness, of brilliant color, of light and shade. There is a picture in every street and in ev at every bazaar stall. In passages from Arabia Deserta, Charles Dothley describes the village people of Teima as inhabiting, I quote him, clay built spacious houses, mostly with an upper floor. The village gave a dreamlike spectacle, a great clay town built in this waste sand with enclosing walls and towers and streets and houses. And there, beside a bluish dark, a bluish dark 
wood of ethel trees upon his dunes. This is Boreida. Luisa Villa has observed, observed that Blanc's Egypt, Blanc's Egypt was not at all a picturesque place of sexual indulgence, sloth, cruelty, despotism, and perpetual political immaturity, not a timeless repository of ancient lore, but a site of austere simplicity and learning, where opinions were debated and, out of traditional religious concerns, new progressive politics could be shaped quite independently of European tutelage, British or otherwise. For the reasons we described before, the sympathetic approach to the Arabic world was stronger in Wilhelmine, Germany. And many institutions and publications emerged during the 19th century dedicated to these topics. The Morgenlandische Altertümer, the Deutsche Morgenlandische Gesellschaft, the Orientalische, the Orientalische Gesellschaft, or the Vorderasiatische Gesellschaft, in, uh, among, among others. It is true that many German travelers complained about the dirt and untidiness uh, uh, that did not seem to fit in their idyllic, idyllic image of the Orient. But there were also uh, other voices. Uh, Count Ald Adalbert Stremberg wrote, Nicht dir aber, oh, sorry. The, Ah, I had the, tra the translation. It will be problematic now. I, 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 want, I, I, copy, I copy my German directly from German. But what's, what he says here is, I cannot, I, I will not read in, in, in German. Uh, but anyway, what he says here is that, that, that uh, I took the, the work of translating all this quote. Sorry. Anyway, uh, we are... Uh, it's a small problem, you will, under will understand. What he said here is that, that uh, again, he found in, 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 the, in, this, in this world a world of, in a way, he, he said, they, did not, they do not need uh, police, police. They, 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 they are, there is, they, it, it does not exist the institution of police. We need the institution of police to protect ourselves. We need to put grids. We need to put, protect our, our properties. These are open houses. These is people who send their, their children to the school. I mean, I, I, I'm not personally saying this. this is what he said. They are uh, sending these children to the uh, to schools that they finance, the people finance. They don't, they, they don't need a state to, to finance this. So he takes this as an example of, uh, in, uh, in opposition to what was happening with, uh, with the, with the, uh, um, with the, with the, uh, German. I, ha I have the translation. I, so just I let I let the first the first phrase. Okay, no, no, I, uh, this uh, make me uh, uh, it's better. Uh, so he say, I ask now, who are the barbarians? Those who form a state where there is no police, no secret spies. Of those where there is a policeman behind every uh, rhinestone corner, or would people be murdered uh, and robbed? in the open. I ask, who are the barbarians? Those who live in their goods open without protection, without the slightest fear uh, of being stolen, or those who barricade their stores with iron grids, uh, provide them with an electricity, electric bell, light them up, and keep them guarded by a night watchman. Uh, Western architecture established uh, as one uh, of its constitutional traits the relationship between theories and pre-existed built examples uh, where these theories could be tested. The traditional intellectual apparatus of architects was not prepared to incorporate, incorporate the examples we are considering until the first decades of the 19th century. It was with the emergence of romantic ideals when the humble settlements of oriental peasants started to acquire conceptual visibility for the architectural institution. Herder's ideas of the philosophy of the history of mankind can be considered as the first justification of the theoretical acceptance of the dignity of vernacular productions, a justification, a justification that can be synthesized in the concept of folk guys, the spirit of people. It was in the writings of John Ruskin where these ideas achieved a systematic form from the first time. 
In fact, it was in his Poetry of Architecture of 1830 where the dwelling of the lower orders started to be taking, taken into consideration for their, their aesthetic ideas. In order to identify its national character, Ruskin's appreciation of the Italian cottages led him to look at them to discover very general common traits. And this is a, one, a drawing of these kind of villages and houses uh, by Ruskin. But as a matter of fact, the most important contribution to understand that these constructions should be considered as a source of inspiration for modern architects came from the concept of typology elaborated by Gottfried Semper. Semper's concept of type is crucial to the development of our argument because in it was implicit the notion of repetition of a form, a notion that will acquire a central role in the debate of modern reproductibility. Semper's idea of repetition of forms implied the possibility to consider popular anonymous domestic architecture as a sort of natural product of human necessities unchanged through, throughout time. His ideas gave strong support to the recovery of poor anonymous architecture from the spaces of death and decadence where Ruskin, in fact, and others located them. According to the studies on our topic, the first attempt to establish a concrete relation between Mediterranean vernacular architecture and the modernist debates was the appreciation of popular houses in Italy by Joseph Olbrich. In his letters from Rome to, see, to his friend Joseph Hoffman, the young architect seems not attracted by the erudite uh, styles existing in the city in Rome, but on the contrary, he was fascinated by the stereometric and simple construction of Capri, where, I quote, the first traces can be found of spontaneous Eastern architecture. End of quote. In fact, we know that Olbrich continued his investigation into spontaneous Eastern architecture by traveling to the coast of North Africa before his return to Vienna. Olbrich's precedent in the admiration of this type of construction was Friedrich Schinkel's discovery, this drawing, of these houses during his first trip to Italy in 1803 under the influence of romantic ideas. Uh, just one year after Olbrich's studies on the spontaneous Eastern architecture, his friend Joseph Hoffman, another winner of the Rome Rises Stipendium, traveled to Italy. Again, it were not the Renaissance or Baroque buildings of the capital which fascinated the young architect. He was deeply moved by the architecture he saw in the countryside, a simple but typical approach to building. And eight, later on, on the, in the steps of Olbrich, it was a feast to be in Capri, he said, and uh, Anna Capri gathering innumerable impressions about simple buildings in harmony with nature. The anti-Roman attitude of both disciples of Otto Wagner was not isolated in fin de siècle Vienna, and those are some drawings by, by their students uh, at the Wagner Schule. Susanne Marchand has studied what she calls a central European German-speaking attack on Rome, implying with that an attack on the cultural hegemony of France in Europe. Marchand also underlines as a new instrument in this controversy the important role of non-philological studies, or as she called them, the studies of artifacts. Needless to say, the multi-ethnic multi composition of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its particular location between East and West contributed to, the consolidate, to consolidate this point of view. It was from the same cultural context that in 1902 emerged the figure of Josef Strigovsky with his book Rome or Orient. Until his death in 1943, Strigovsky ceaselessly campaigned campaign for the appreciation of the intrinsic beauties of Near Eastern and folkish forms and exer exercised an enormous influence over, over Austrian art historian, artists, and architects. 
The first modern house where the flat roof was used was the Scheu house by Adolf Loos in Wien, in Vienna. We will come back to this topic, but let us now remember that when this house was finished in 1912, the Sunday, this I'm quoting Laws, the Sunday wal walkers, uh, sorry, the, the Sunday walkers were allergic to it and cursed because it looked Algerian in Vienna. In fact, Laws himself wrote again about this house that it was said that such a construction would probably be in Algiers, but not in Vienna. It had not, I had not uh, thought of the Orient at all, says Laws. In spite of Laws' negation about the, his interest in, Alge in, in Algiers' vernacular architecture, the fact is that during the building process of his famous Michaelerplatz building, he visited that country and Morocco in March 1910. In the village of Ainsnara, he found the marmor he was looking for, and the impact of this place was strong enough for him to decide to come back to it in December for holidays of this, the same year, for holidays with his uh, recently married wife. Moreover, it's important to notice that in the same text, Laws presented the flat roof as a sort of ob object of desire in Western architecture. He said, we must ask ourselves why the terraces have been used in the East for centuries and had not uh, been used in our latitudes. But since the discovery of the cement roof and wood, gravel roof, and from the use of asphalt, it is also possible to build the flat roof and therefore the terrace. For four, four centuries, the flat roof in the West, in the West, says Laws, was the dream of construction artists. Thanks to these new technologies, he continues, in the middle of the 19th century, this dream was realized. It was as part of the, this Viennese cultural climate that by focusing his dissertation in the vernacular building methods uh, in the Iceland, these are some other, these kind of uh, houses uh, by, by laws, but I'm referring now, now to other uh, figure uh, uh, in, in the, this by, by Viennese uh, cultural climate, climate uh, and uh, interested in the, uh, in the vernacular uh, building methods uh, in the island of Santorini, namely Bernard Rudowski, who started in 1929 to follow what will be the Ad Adrian's thread of the investigation that will be presented many years later, many years later, in the 60s, as architecture without architects one of the most successful architectural theses of the 20th uh, century architecture. And this is part of uh, Rudowski's studies uh, in 1929. While he was studying at, at the Technische Hochschule uh, in Wien uh, in the 20s, he was under the influence of Josef Frank, Oskar Strand, Oskar Blach, and Walter Sobotka. This architect, architect circle which created a typically Viennese variety of modernism between 1910 and the 1920s was marked by a spirit of discovery, historical research and writing, and curiosity about other cultures, especially those in the East. As was studied by Maria Velsig under the influence of Strigovsky, Rudowski maintained an interest in anonymous architecture and the lifestyles, housing, and urban culture of the Middle, Middle and Far East. Since 1929, Rudowski spent a long time in Santorini, an island that was part of the Ottoman Empire between uh, 1779 and 1921. It was in, uh, in, in 1932 he traveled to Capri, Na Naples, Procida, Positano, and finally to Milan. And then to, to, uh, he went to America, to Brazil, and then to the United States. Le Corbusier's relation with the vernacular Orient uh, can be observed as early as 1907-08, or 
during the time of his experience with Auguste Perret and his meeting with Charles Garnier. When Le Corbusier was drawing in Perret's atelier in Paris, the Frère Perret enterprise was engaged in the construction of the cathedral in Oran, Algiers. Perret's relationship with that city can be traced back at least to 1902, the date of his project for Oran's theater. On his part, Garnier did exhibit his relieve from Tusculum, a reconstruction of the Roman city in 1904, inspired by the previous reconstruction of Delphos by Tour uh, Tourner and Bergamo by Pontremoli, in an event that he used also for presenting his project for the Cité Industrielle. The reconstruction of Tusculum was uh, obviously inspired by the contemporary architecture of his contemporary architecture of the Italian villages, and one can see this work as a preparation for the flat roof, roof uh, houses and buildings which characterize the utopian city published in his book of 1917. Of course, regarding Le Corbusier, this, uh, to these early approaches, one has to add, of course, uh, his famous Voyage à Orient uh, in 1911. Uh, it was a, a, a in part a different Orient, but it was also an, uh, uh, an important Orient for him, as we all know. Ho, ho, however, and this, this was the beginning of uh, Corbusier's idea, ideas, uh, however, it was not in France, but in Germany, where the connection between the new architecture and vernacular Near Eastern achieved uh, uh, achieved its biggest intensity. Uh, the Villa Alegonda in Holland from 1912 is another of the earliest examples of the modernist use of the flat, flat roof. The villa was built with the intervention of, as we know, Jacob Peter Out, who was a young student in that moment, 1912 and whose work was limited, in that case, was the first construction by him, to follow, whose work was limited to follow the owner's instructions. And the owner of the house was the painter Menzo Kamerling Ones, whom, as the villa uh, uh, would be a house on the beach, wished to recreate the images he had collected during his, trip, his trips to North Africa. Out, and this, this is, uh, this is some, these are some paintings uh, in, in southern Italy, but of course, uh, again, uh, with this enthusiasm with, for this cube kind of construction, and this is another beautiful uh, 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 document, which is uh, one of uh, family, fa fami uh, from the family of uh, Camerlingons, uh, this portrait made by Camerlingons in Arabian, in Arabic uh, dress. So this was part of this, uh, this climate in, 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 in the Netherlands, it mainly uh, uh, around, around, around Oud. Uh, Oud. Oud was part of the cultural circle ar uh, around uh, the industrialist Karl Ernst Osthaus, a leading figure of the Deutsche Bergbund and one of the most sophisticated protagonists of German modernist culture. Shortly after the war, Osthau asked Bruno Tau to draw up plans for a school with uh, workshops and houses as the crown of Hohenhagen. The inspiration for the project came from Tau's new book on the ideal city uh, on high, the Stadt Krone, illustrated with many examples from the past, including Italian and other Mediterranean hill towns, which was to represent a new sense of community and non-political socialism. And this part of the illustration in the Stadtkrone by uh, Bruno Taut. Osthaus' lifelong interest in the Middle East needs to be underlined because his circle was one of the many centers where the new ideas were being expressed and disseminated until they reached its peak of intensity and confrontation in the Bauhaus school. Many studies analyzed the political reason that located the flat roof in the center of this confrontation, transforming an apparently neutral debate about technical feature, a technical feature in a sort of culture camp. Since Baltagropius Fagus factory built in 1911, 
The adoption of this type of building uh, coverage became a hot area of litigation between traditionalists and modernists. The status of Middle Eastern precedents was sometimes contested or supported both to defend or to attack the legitimacy of, this, of the use of this, <laughs> sorry, <coughs> this resource. Immediately after the war, the expression in circles uh, uh, in architectural culture were particularly attracted by the Orient. <clears throat> Under the leadership of Herbert Walden, the circle of their Sturm was impregnated by Oriental curiosity. In the Café des Westens, Walden gathered, among others, <coughs> figures like uh, Karl Einstein, Karl Kraus, Loos, himself, Döblin, Kokoschka, Friedlander, Scherbart, and Gropius himself. It is very well known that with, uh, uh, the, with the arrival of Laszlo Moholinaj and Theo, Theo van Duisburg to the Bauch, Bauhaus, the idea of an abstract cubic architecture and with it the adoption of a flat roof received the most clear aesthetic justification for the new architecture. In spite of the fact that the idea came from the artist field and was later on adapted by architects, it is true that the cube and the flat surfaces were good representations of surface uh, of standardized and industrialized architecture, and mainly with this abstract idea of, of a house I showed at the, at the beginning. Nonetheless, it is also true that a flat surface was not precisely the most appropriate form for a central European roof. According to the development of building technologies, as well as to the local climate. In fact, even though the tra traditionalist arguments were associated to nationalism and considered uh, uh, and, and ra racism, the most solid point against their use was technical. Because that reason, because it was not adapted to the north. The flat roof was considered appropriate to dry climates of North Africa, but not for the cold, rainy, and snowy climates of Northern Europe. For Paul Schulze-Naumburg, the most staunch opponent of the adoption of the flat roof, he said, the reason for the fact that the roofs are stepped in the north Inclined slightly in Italy and do not exist in the Orient is simply the fact that in the north there is snow and ice on them, rainwater is to be discharged in Italy, and in the Orient neither circumstances occur. But even for a non radical supporter of the new architecture, like Bernard Hegemann, I mean, he was a supporter, not a radical uh, right, um, right wing thinking person, he said, the opponents of uh, Schulze-Naumburg must not forget that he, Schulze-Naumburg, not only for racist reasons, but also from their own personal experience, manifests himself against the flat roof. In the same article, Hegemann remembered that Schulze-Naumburg had often built flat terraces in his projects, and he perfectly knew that these features were most expensive and created more difficulties than the traditional pitched roofs. It is uh, my assumption that the adoption of the flat roof by the Central European architects was due to the general impulse to abstraction in modern culture, which meant that the solution departed from an aesthetic foundation evidently contrary to the cheapest and effective technical solution at, the, at that moment. This somehow illogical solu solution could achieve a central role in Central Europe, and especially in Germany, due to the hegemonic presence of artists and painters in the most advanced design centers. We have seen the importance of the expressionist relationship with the Orient, and regarding to our topic, uh, 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 the other, perhaps more important source for the adoption of the flat roof in architecture was, of course, cubism. This is an intensely visited argument in the studies of modern uh, culture, and we will not deal with it here again. I will just remember two cases. One is an article by Joseph uh, Kapek in 1913's issue of Der Sturm. Uh, 
where he pointed out that the new architecture will follow the example of cubism. For Capek, the synthesis was still not achieved, and this is why, I quote him, it was also sometimes the case that this new procedure was applied to traditional architectural schemes, which in this way got a modern mummification. The author was convinced that the solution had to wait for a more advanced stage of the culture. The other is uh, uh, 1925's uh, Theo, Theo van Dersburg's article in Basmuts, where he clearly postulated that the building structure, in the conventional sense, still a composition of individual cubes, dissolves into uh, its two and one dimensional component. Once accepted the principle of a cubic, a cubic almost abstract aggregation of the masses as a departure, departure point for modern architecture, it was evident that vernacular Middle Eastern villages were the best inspiring precedent to confirm the spa spatial and urban efficiencies of such an idea. A concrete bridge between a painterly vision, Middle Eastern uh, presence, precedence and the formation of the new ideas in architecture was represented, represented by the influential presence of two of the leading figures of his periods, Vasily Kandinsky and Paul Klee, both of them fascinated by the built landscape they had the opportunity to personally acquaint themselves with, with before the war in North Africa. Kandinsky, and this is uh, August, uh, August Macke um, uh, paintings uh, the from the same period, uh, and these are Kandinsky. Uh, re some of them uh, uh, painted in the inside, and some of them uh, just memories of uh, using memories of of uh, the, this uh, site. Uh, studies like uh, uh, Kandinsky and Gabriele Münter. Uh, his uh, partner in that moment, traveled to Africa in December 1904. Studies like Landstrasse or Arabische Stadt were done during the, their visit to uh, Tunis. Both artists produced numerous sketches, drawings, and photos of landscape in El Ariana and Sidi Bo Said, or of architectural details in Booten and in Kairouan. Even after that trip, can this Kandinsky repeatedly drew color representation of Tunisian motifs. Paul Klee visited Tunis, in, uh, and, uh, in particular in Kairouan, in 1914 with Macke, August Macke, and uh, Moyer, and as was attested by many scholars, this, ex this is uh, Paul Klee in Kairouan, it, uh, as was attested by many scholars, this experience in the Middle East was crucial for his, his career. Klee, was hired by Gropius at the Bauhaus uh, in November 1921, and the book on Kairouan was published the following Christmas, December 1921. Needless to say, from this moment on, the teaching of Clay in the Bauhaus had an extraordinary importance. It can be uh, maintained that the flat roof strike started in 1922, when it became more and more frequently employed by German modernist architects. It was in 1922, this is again Paul uh, and these are some, um, some books on uh, oriental houses, I choose some of them, published in, in German studies, deep studies on, uh, uh, on this uh, kind of uh, houses, uh, technical, even technical studies, uh, you can see plans, etc., in, in, in this book, it's, mm, full of these kind of uh, examples of this uh, moment. Uh, it was in 1922 when Hermann Hoyce uh, put uh, the issue, uh, no, yeah, yeah, uh, put the issue at the center of the debates. In, uh, in the Mitteilungen des Deutschen Bergbundes, announcing that seen, fr fr uh, uh, talking or writing see, from this uh, enormously influential uh, uh, magazine, announcing that the Association for the Protection of Our Homeland has the need to manifest his opposition to the Oriental flat roofing. I mean, he was very conscious about the 
condition of being or oriental. Uh, in the Bauhaus exhibition in Weimar uh, that took place in 1923, the use of the flat roof was assumed as a modernist banner. In the event, it was exhibited at the House am Horn by Georg Müche and at the plan, uh, and at the plan for, the, for a Bauhaus estate in, this, in Dessau by Fred Forbat. And one cannot forget two other provocative flat roof examples of 1923, Miss van der Rohe project for a house in brick and other in concrete, we know very, very well in, from this moment. The debate about the non-European pertinence of the flat roof reached its most explicit expression as a result of an initiative by Walter Gropius. In 1926, he decided to expand the discussion outside Germany, pointing to an international internationalization of the problem. The flat roof should lose its local characterization as a typical Middle Eastern feature to transform itself into a universal and idiosyncratically trait of modern architecture. In order to do so, he presented the topic in the architectural magazine Die Bauwelt, proposing a questionnaire with five points. Alluding to the examples he exposed in his Internationale Architecture the year before, Gropius defended the flat roof as an aesthetic device that should belong to architects worldwide and not to be limited to a region. He is very clear about his demand of the cube and the flat roof as a formal requisite that can have a technical, can, I would say, can find a technical solution. And it is this technical justification that he took for, for in this questionnaire. The opinions gathered by Gropius' questionnaire were published together uh, in a special issue of Das Neue Frankfurt, called precisely Das Flache Dach, this, this, some other examples of uses uh, in this early moment, everybody went to the, that landscape. And this is this issue of uh, Das Neue Frankfurt, uh, uh, this Sonder, Sonder, Sonder Numa Das Flache Dach in uh, 1927. The creme de la creme of modern architects of the time participated in this issue most of them trying to justify with economic, functional, and technical arguments the adoption of this feature. Exceptionally, Le Corbusier recognized that, that the use of reinforced concrete allowed, I quote him, an oriental garden full of touching beauty. Uh, uh, allowed to create an oriental garden full of touching beauty. But André Lursa, was the only one who recognized the importance of the oriental influence for the preference of the, plaf, the flat roof by modern architecture. More than this, in his presentation, he attributed to nationalist prejudices the resistance to admit this influence. He wrote, and I will, I will make a long quote, the, pub the public, which is surprised by the simplicity and the completely new expressive possibilities of the reinforced concrete in flat covers had ch has shaped the slogan of the oriental manner of, of hospitality. I take up this word orient and want to speak of it, but in a completely different sense. We are now returning to an ancient tradition with the new means of our technique and it is a half unconscious return to the sources, to the earth, I would like to say. Our present simple buildings recall those of Algiers, Greece, Italy, and even those of the south of France. Why wonder about it? Since the Mediterranean civilization is for us the most perfect expression of a massive reason. Our most recent modern gestures which have once again been approached before the eternal sense of architecture, have led us in the natural way to the Orient, which is the path of our civilization and to its eternal forms. Referring to the nationalist arguments, he added, it is not yet possible to determine the date at which the races with their so different temperament have become so mixed 
that the general and truly international expression becomes possible. On the other hand, one must realize with pleasure that every great revelation of the human genius has very quickly transcended the political frontiers of a country for the benefit of all mankind. We can therefore only wish that architecture, once it has once again come to revelation of the greatest style, will also be able to achieve international validity. I'm going to the end. <laughs> In the previous paragraph, we have pointed out that extra-European extra cultural experiences and images must, must be considered as part of the thick network of philosophical, technical, political, social, and economic consideration that can explain the emergence of a very constitutive trait of modern architecture. These experiences and images received different names, Saracen, Oriental, Arab, Algerian, Islamic, Ottoman, Persian, Moroccan, and even Italian or Spanish. We saw the German-speaking countries adopted these names and significances looking for alternatives to the Latin heritage identified which, with French hegemony in cultural European history. But in parallel, in parallel uh, with this search, a new alternative was being created and installed. This alternative was the concept of the Mediterrane. As a cultural counteroffensive to the German Middle, Middle Euro, uh, European attempt to install itself in the center of modern times. Thanks to the idea of Mediterrane, the local diversity and the very different manifestations of the western and eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea were unified as belonging to a to an essential unit. Under this unifying conceptual umbrella, the discussion will be around the political place of these diversities in the synthesis. In spite, and remember, uh, this was the moment when uh, the big uh, book on the Mediterranean was, was written. In spite of the many dif different interpretations and cultural controversies since the 19th century, it will, in, in the field of architectural ideas, it will be under the leadership of Le, Cor Le Corbusier during the last years of the 20s and the beginning of the 30s that the idea of Mediterranean was finally adopted to identify exclusively the Latin soul of Southern Europe, living in shadows its North African and Muslim component. This victory was consecrated in 1933, uh, and this is, we know, the, the, this is the Kashba by the, the initial project, the, the model uh, by Ms. van der Rohe for the Bison Hot Syndrome, and I, I'm going now to this picture. This victory was consecrated in 1933 in a memorable international event after meeting for the second time in Frankfurt in 1929, the realization in 1933 of the Third Congress International or Congress International d'Architecture Moderne on board of a ship navigating the Mediterranean, departing from Marseille, was the most clear recognition of the efficacy that this idea had acquired in the construction of 20th century's architectural narrative. And this is a fantastic picture which shows, shows some participants of the uh, 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 Patris uh, trip in the Mediterranean visiting these, these kind of constructions and some people there and this final image of what was the big uh, Le Corbusier operation taking this from the Northern Africa and putting, locating the center of this new interpretation in Paris, uh, and not, not negating that, but locating the center in, uh, in Paris, in France, as the, as the, as the center for the Latin, the Latin uh, world. And let me finish, let me, let me end with this beautiful image. It, it, was, it was a gift to me, <laughs> for me, for, from some people from Israel, uh, because I, I think it's amazing to see this picture of in the 30s with these camels, with this modern architecture, but in reality in northern, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, in the, when all this his history started uh, so early in the 19th century. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you.